Today it's our high privilege to be speaking with Dr. Brian Shelton. Dr. Brian Shelton is the Chief Academic Officer at Tacoa Falls College in Tacoa, Georgia, and author of the text that we're going to be discussing today, Quest for the Historical Apostles, Tracing Their Lives and Legacies. Thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jonathan, and thanks for the Aqueduct Project for their work. Very gladly. Dr. Shelton, the title of the book, Quest for the Historical Apostles, echoes Albert Schweitzer's Quest of the Historical Jesus, now published over a century ago. But your quest is a little different, and you tend to be more accepting of the historical data available to us, at least as compared to Schweitzer in his quest. What principles do you lay down for admitting evidence to the table concerning your historical reconstruction of the lives and ministries of the apostles? The principles for evidence for a study like this are essential, and identifying them at the beginning of a study is, is crucial for, for understanding how historical we, we can be. A true north for historicity, if you could say that, was orientation with scripture. From the outset, I self-identified as an evangelical Christian writing history for the church. The New Testament testimony of 12 apostles plus Paul is foundational for a study of this, and I consider it to be a trustworthy history source. Uh, in this way, I was a little different than Schweitzer, who, although he believed in the New Testament, he provided a different framework of interpreting it within itself. Uh, this quest, on the other hand, trusts the scripture as a historical source and then goes beyond the New Testament into the earliest centuries of the church. A second principle was the use of early church histories and commentaries with an eye for bias and an eye for borrowing from prior generations. As the church began to write about its own formation, it captured stories of the apostles after the New Testament and the veracity of those stories or its potential, that was a principle for evidence. Finally, a third principle was the engagement of Gnostic Acts, uh, works written in the second through fifth century that the early church uh, that we know as the Catholic did not accept these books and the entire worldview theologically because of the contrast that it had with what they considered to be scripture. And so it's very different than the Christianity that we're familiar with, but still the texts have historical facts that can be redeemed. Those were the three main principles for evidence. Dr. Shelton, in your task of reconstructing this broad body of evidence concerning the, uh, the apostles, you take then not just orthodox sources, but you're sifting through all kinds of different evidence. Um, what are some of the more outlandish stories and episodes that you gathered in as you began accumulating all kinds of traditions about the apostles? Sure. Beyond the New Testament, there are various genre of writings which are attributed to the apostles. We call them apocryphal because they're not canonical. That is, they were generally not accepted by the mainstream early church. And they come in the form of gospels, like the gospels we know, acts, like the acts that we know, uh, revelation, that is additional apocryphal material in the form of a vision that are different than what we know. The apocryphal acts are particularly important for th this study because like the book of Acts, they describe the journeys of the apostles. They have various encounters with various people groups and the supernatural is a key element, just as you see in the book of Acts. Some of the more outlandish was when Philip was being crucified. He cursed the 20 some thousand people who had crucified him and who were watching him passively or who were jeering at him. And so in his curse, Philip saw all 20,000 of them die. And he continues um, to be crucified during this episode. And then Jesus appears and he rebukes G uh, Philip, tells Philip that Bartholomew being um, punished nearby is going to be set free, but that Philip would die and Jesus resurrects all 20,000 people that he encountered in that episode. Uh, you know, 
um, some of the more interesting ones involve animals. When Paul is in the wilderness of northern Palestine, he encounters a lion and the lion wanders into his camp and, and perhaps Paul was scared at first. But then the lion asked Paul, are you the apostle? And Paul answered the lion and said, yes. So the lion inquired about the faith and Paul discipled the lion. And it seems that the lion was baptized by Paul. And then they go their different directions. And you fast forward in time, Paul is in the amphitheater in Ephesus. He has been on trial and he is now thrown to the people uh, to, to die for execution. And the magistrate yells for the animals to be unleashed and they open the gate and the lion comes out into the amphitheater and it comes up to Paul and Paul says, lion? And the lion responds, apostle? And Paul says to the lion, how did they catch you? And the lion responds, well, the same way that they caught you. And then they worship together and the people get frustrated and then the lion fights off other animals so that they can't attack Paul. And then an earthquake comes and everyone flees and Paul and the lion go their different directions after parting goodbye. You throw in Matthew, who is attacked by a dragon that is conjured by some, um, some magicians, and the dragon is turned from Matthew back to chase the people that conjured it against him. And those are just some of the many, many stories that take place in these apocryphal acts. The reason that they are so controversial is their fantasticism. But at the same time, the church has too easily dismissed them entirely because of these particular stories. And one of the main premises of the book is that we can gain some history. We can gain some stories, maybe some types of sermons that were preached by these particular apostles in between the lions and the dragons. Hmm. I suppose even a comic book uh, doesn't give us historical information, doesn't give us historical fact about the 20th century, but comic books do reflect the time period. And so I suppose even these fantastic stories do reflect something of their time period. Um, um, we have all kinds of this post-canonical Christian literature that comes up and starts giving us these wonderful stories of the apostles. How do you read these later works about the apostles? Is, is this the romance version of the apostolic stories? Is this the comic book version? What's what's behind the production of this literature? Romance version is not bad. Comic book actually is quite accurate. It's not designed to be a comic as if it says by its very cover, this is imaginary. Don't believe this and don't try these things at home. Uh, but really romantic, romantic is best, but it is theologically driven. This goes to the Gnostic worldview. This is the, the, the belief system of those who wrote it. They may have seen themselves as Christian, uh, but particularly they emphasize the role of the divine vision that Jesus provides for salvation uh, as the, the primary means of understanding sanctification and eternal life, liberation from the body. And so these authors, they do seem to be telling the stories at times as if they were mythical and that they do reflect the truth. These are the types of the stories that the apostles might engage, or these are the types of miracles. Uh, but at the same time, because there is no disclaimer on the cover and there is no theological method that is explained, we aren't exactly sure how much Gnostics believed was historical. And in that sense, if they did believe it or were trying to convince audiences that it's real, then it really, it is like a comic book uh, because it's hard to believe too many people would believe it. The naive might particularly believe it. We're not real sure what Gnostics think and the extent of belief, uh, but we can't certainly believe it on its face value because if it's not intended to be myth, um, I think a lot of it we have to actually admit that it is mythical, mm -hmm. not true. It's our privilege today to speak with Dr. Brian Shelton, author of Quest for the Historical Apostles, Tracing Their Lives and Legacies. Dr. Shelton, let's pivot now from looking at some of the more fantastic traditions concerning the apostles, and let's see if we can bore down and get some good, clean historical fact. Let's start with Peter, if we may. 
Peter is not only remembered in the Gospels as the leader of the apostolic band, but some of the very most fascinating archaeological evidence that we have from any of the apostles or from any of early church history pertains to Peter's story. What do you make of the Vatican's claim in 1968 to have uncovered the very bones of St. Peter? There is an uncontested tradition that Peter was buried somewhere on the Vatican after his execution on the circus there. There was an oblong track that was used for, for many reasons. It could be sporting events, it could be games, and executions took place there in the center of the circus. That Peter died there, there is no competition for that in church history. Uh, that he is buried there is quite likely. Uh, naturally, he would have been buried there, along with everyone else who died that day. It was also equally likely that Christians would have valued his burial location. Uh, this is evidence, including in Rome, by martyrs like Prudenciana and Prasade in Rome, who were arrested and they were killed because they were caring for the bodies of Christians who had died. It seems to be resurrection based, that is that there's a hope, so let's preserve the body. In an age where people were cremated or just, just thrown aside in terms of their bodies, the church is caring for the tombs of particularly the martyrs. So with Peter being an apostle, there's quite a bit of potential that the early church would have remembered where his tomb was. Even before gaining full protection, there's record that Christians built an edifice over top of this location that eventually became a church, and that location would be solidified for generations to follow. Now, several excavations have taken place there. Uh, most know the 1968 that you referenced. Uh, backing up one step in the 1940s, there was quite a bit of analysis of uh, lots of things buried on the Vatican, male, female, even animals from the circus. It was a dumping graveyard. And so the early days of Peter's burial would be the more crucial, memorable days. Uh, but in 1968, there was identified a set of bones of a 5'4 man, which was tall for the time were found specially stored in a location from the altar. And of course, the Vatican um, led these excavations. Scientifically certain they belong to the apostle, that's really hard to say. But the potential is extremely high, given the memorabilia effect that would have come with the burial of Peter. Thank you so much, Dr. Shelton. Dr. Shelton, what do you make of the authenticity of Paul's grave? Uh, preserved at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls in Rome. How convincing is this archaeological case? The burial location of Paul is historically as solid as any apostle and as, as one possibly probably could have. Eusebius in the fourth century records how Gaius back in the second century said, and I quote, I can show the trophies of the apostles. If you'll go to the Vatican or to the Ostian Road, you will find the trophies of those who have laid the foundation of the church. Such a statement testifies to the authenticity of the burial places of both Peter and Paul. The Basilica of Paul rests right there along the same ancient Ostian way that Gaius um, referenced and that commonly people were buried along outside of the walls. And so how convincing is the archeological case? I would say it's very strong. And there has been, again, like Peter, there's been no contestation in the early church for the bones of Paul or any nearby resting places that would compete with such a tradition. Dr. Shelton, thank you so much for those responses. Dr. Shelton, I happen to know that you have visited Rome and seen the archaeological evidence for the burial places of, the Saint, of Saint Peter and Paul many times. You've explored those thoroughly. When we turn to the Apostle John, we have the tradition that John traveled to Ephesus, spent his later years there, and also carried for Mary, the mother of Jesus. John may be among Peter and Paul as one of the most important apostles, but the archaeological evidence that we have in Ephesus is much more slight. How do you evaluate the tradition concerning John's later years? John is an example of an apostle who has a strong geographic anchor without a lot of the ancient artifacts or 
edifices or sites remaining. Uh, nonetheless, there is a strong tradition in the text and in the uh, traditions of the church going forward that John centered his ministry in Ephesus. There are stories of John moving across Greece and across other parts of modern Turkey, as well as being a prisoner for a short stint in Rome before his exile to Patmos. Uh, but really, Ephesus is the main center. This tradition cites that he died there, and it's not disputed by another location. Among the apocryphal New Testament acts, in fact, which have a lot of reference to Ephesus, these are considered to be perhaps the oldest apocryphal acts that we have. Meanwhile, church tradition does center Mary towards the end of her life in Ephesus. So there's a historical sense that Jesus' words from the cross in John 19 might have been taken seriously, uh, that John did see to her welfare. And that might actually be the reason that she's in Ephesus or um, that he ends up uh, ending his, his own life there in that region. Dr. Shelton, as we move to some of the lesser apostles, some of the lesser known apostles among the 12, um, as you were sifting through all of this evidence, how did your own understanding of what an apostle was and the meaning of an apostolic ministry, how perhaps did that change in your own mind through this study? That interesting question is reflected in the table of contents of the book, actually. Who is an apostle? Um, what do we do with Luke, who calls Judas Iscariot an apostle? Does Matthias warrant a chapter in the book? And of course, Paul. How do you write a book on the apostles, uh, the 12, without Paul? Uh, the truth is, actually, sometimes we speak of the 12 as if Paul was one of them, uh, but that's a total of 13. Uh, you know, the apostles are significant in their own right for their very office that they serve and the very symbol that they represent in leadership of the early church. Uh, for example, the 12 tribes of Israel find an analogy in the 12 apostles in the New Testament. So there's a lot of various types of significance that comes with surrounding the office of the apostle. Uh, but when it came to the figures themselves, uh, Matthias is included in the book as a replacement for Judas. Judas is not, although he has his own uh, history beyond the New Testament, surprising many people, as there are stories that he stayed alive after the experience of the hanging. Uh, but the 13th chapter really is Paul, and so much has been written on Paul that that chapter is quite different. In, in the answer about the, the office of apostolicity and what it means that there were particularly 12 moving forward for the life of the church, it seems almost like a divine design that there would be leaders that particularly leave their stamp. And in the book of Acts, we see the apostles continuing the message of Jesus. Their leadership is, has a powerful historical testimony, a credibility to it, because they walked with the master. Uh, the top tier, if you will, particularly of the disciples, Peter, James, John, and then also Andrew sometimes, uh, as the most significant leaders, that is those at least most cited in the book of Acts, they have witness that very few people have. Uh, for example, in uh, Matthew 17, to the transfiguration of Jesus. So they were these men, these 12, were able to have encounters moving forward, particularly centered on the resurrection, that they knew that the gospel they were preaching was real because it had transformed their own life and transformed the countryside and the lives of the people around it. Uh, this gives shape to the office of apostle. And of course, Peter is an important apostle. And you see one tradition, the West Roman Catholicism recognizes Peter's influence in Rome as being the, the first of the apostles. And of course, the first bishop of Rome, which eventually evolves into uh, the office of the, the Pope as we know it. And so the, the, the apostles and who they are and what it means to be an apostle does go in many directions. Uh, but really, I, th I think the thing that I gained the most since you framed the question that way is the influence that they had because of the experiences that they had, that they laid a foundation for the church for the future that was authentic and credible and was eyewitness, particularly in terms of writing that becomes scripture.
those things are invaluable in the identity of the church. And here in the 21st century, we're heirs to their legacy. Dr. Shelton, if I can ask questions concerning two more of these lesser known apostles. Uh, one concerning Philip. In 2011, the Italian archaeologist Francesco D'Andri announced the very exciting discovery of the tomb of Philip in uh, Hierapolis. What's your view concerning the authenticity of this recently announced discovery? What an exciting announcement and what an ex exciting discovery um, D'Andrea has made here. Hierapolis in modern Turkey has long been the central location for the ministry of Philip. The acts of Philip are crazy, Dr. Armstrong, fantastical, miraculous stories, some of the greatest and in that sense, some of the worst. But it also has historical anchors. Trajan is named, Ananias, Hierapolis as a location for the ministry of Philip, which of course in Acts, eventually Paul is going to encounter a Philip that seems to be the same Philip in this location. The city for a long time has hosted a martyrium, a resting place of the bones, or at least an old tomb. Although there is a tradition that those bones were moved to Constantinople and moved to Rome, where some 1873 analysis came with supposed confirmation. Dondria was smart to dig around Hierapolis, where apparently he, he found another martyrium for sure. It's about 40 yards away from the traditional spot, and he found a first century tomb in its center of an, what seems to be an old fourth or fifth century church. There is supposedly an ancient image, a bread stamp, with Philip robed under a canopy, and this archaeologist feels like he's found an exact structure that fits uh, the, the image of that canopy. And so that offers uh, some, poor, some support. So I think it makes sense that this is more likely the original grave, but you know, certainly the acre of land has doubled in its, its possibility of its authenticity as the original burial place of Philip. Hmm. Dr. Shelton, if I can ask one last question uh, concerning the apostles, and that is, what about Thomas? Uh, tradition affirms that Thomas traveled further east than any of the other apostles, traditionally arriving in India. And this is a tradition also that's enthusiastically received in the south of India today. What's your view on Thomas's journey to India? In the ancient world, India seems to be everything beyond the Roman Empire, which of course is modern India. There is historical evidence of tradition that is quite overwhelming in India. And even, in fact, Northwest India uh, moving west into the old Roman Empire, that may have been a journey location for Thomas. The ancient links are few, even though the, the tradition is strong. Among the most interesting of the apocryphal acts do see him going east, either by land or by boat. If by land, that fits the traditions of Syria and Parthia, modern Iran. A supposedly an early modern Portuguese explorer landed in India and was shocked to find established Christian churches, generations old, and they claimed their descent from the evangelism of Thomas. Thomas Christians is a common term in, in Indian, in the Christian culture that's there. In fact, it's a source of pride that they would have a link to this apostle. His legends are so plentiful in the country that this is the one apostle map in the book that has two crosses representing the likely death city or region of that apostle. Because there were so many competing traditions, actually there are probably three that should be taken seriously, uh, but two seem to rise above the third. And yes, Southern India in particular uh, adopts quite a bit of strong oral tradition. It's contained in songs, it's contained in liturgical elements, it can, it's contained in stories that have been passed down over the generations. There's some Indian Christian historians that have begun to write in the, the latter part of the last century for us that helps to explain these stories and these songs that are centered around Thomas's legacy. So it would be hard to deny that Thomas's, Thomas was there. Um, at least one has to concede that there's strong influence early, even if one was to deny his physical presence. Dr. Shelton, we're very, very grateful for your reflections.
if I could ask one closing question, and that is a question that we've been asking all of the interviewees on this program, and that is this. What would it mean for the church to be united? How would we recognize this unity, and what is it that we can do as Christians today to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? The apostles provide a testimony to unity. When I think of how they crossed land and sea to take forth the same gospel that had transformed their own lives, they crossed cultural and they class, crossed class boundaries to preach the good news. And they did so without regard to race or to local custom, uh, but accepted both as long as regional values didn't compete with the gospel, you know, such as human sacrifice or polygamy. And by crossing these boundaries and reaching people really of all walks and of all cultures, they perpetuated the principle of the earliest church in Acts who shared their needs with resources with one another, and they were of one accord or of one mind. This is just one of the many inspirations of the journeys of the apostles that can be offered to the contemporary church. That in their unity, they had the same gospel that kept taking them back to the same purpose. And as that went forth, you really saw Christians across various gradients being able to call one another brother and sister and break the same bread and share the same baptism. And so when I think of unity and think of the contemporary church, which often shows disunity, uh, then the answer could be a little cliche, Dr. Armstrong, but going back to the Bible, uh, the model that we see of the earliest church in Acts, unity. <laughs> it's been our delight today to be speaking with Dr. Brian Shelton, Chief Academic Officer of Tocoa Falls College and author of the text that we've been discussing today, Quest for the Historical Apostles, Tracing Their Lives and Legacies, available from this year, 2018. Dr. Shelton, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Dr. Armstrong, for having me.